Good afternoon. I would like to call to order the regular board meeting of the Vallecitos Water District for March 20th, 2024. Before we begin, I'd like to announce that members of the public may watch the meeting live via computer or smart device by going to the district's website and clicking on the watch live icon. However, they will not be able to participate in the meeting remotely. Members of the public may also listen to the meeting live on their phone by dialing 888-788-0099 toll free or 877-853-5247 also toll free. When prompted, enter the meeting ID and passcode displayed on the district's website. We will now have the Pledge of Allegiance, and Director Grosset, will you please lead us? Ready? Begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we will take attendance. Directors, please indicate your attendance. Great, we are all here, thank you. Do we have any additions or modifications to the agenda, General Manager Gumpel? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, staff would like to remove item 2.4, an action item, from the agenda. Okay, may I have a motion to remove item, or to accept the agenda? with the proposed modification with the removal of item 2.4. So moved. Thank second. You. Thank you, Director Ellitharp, for the motion. And second, Vice President Pinnock. Is there any discussion? Okay, please vote. Thank you, the motion carries. Moving on to public comment, do we have any public speakers? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Second, thank you. Motion by Director Grosset, seconded by Vice President Pinnock. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, please vote. Thank you, the motion carries. Now we will move on to our action items. Action item 2.1, District Investment Advisor Introduction and Overview of Investment Strategies. I believe I'm turning this over to yeah, General yeah, Manager Gumpel. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'll be turning this over to Wes Owen, our Chief Financial Officer, and I believe he also will have our new Investment Advisor joining remotely. So. Are they on, Wes, or are they still waiting? I don't know. They're on? Okay, awesome. Thank <laughs> you. So, with that, Wes, take it away. James, do you want to put this in presentation mode? Uh, the PowerPoint? Is that PowerPoint or just PDF? PDF. Do you guys remember the, there's, a, there's a tool to make PDF a wider? Control L. Control L? Thank you. There you go. Okay, good evening, President Boyd Hodgson, members of the board. As you remember, uh, in February, we actually went out for RFP and, and contracted with GPA, Government Portfolio Associates, uh, to handle our investing going forward. Um, so they are now fully on board. Um, we've, they actually did the last investment report that was in your board packet. Uh, Maybe in this board packet. Actually, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> and yesterday we had a meeting to start talking about strategies and how they'll be handling our investments. And you know that, um, as we presented before, we have internal and outsourced investments. They we're meeting with them, strategizing on how we can kind of work on both of those. So they'll be helping us talk about how much we need to maintain liquid and how much will be invested. Uh, and Dean Woodring, who's the President of GPA is actually here today to discuss that strategy with you and, and kind of kick it off as an introduction. So with that, I'll introduce Deanne and, and hello, Deanne. Hello, uh, Ms. President and members of the board, it's a privilege to be in front of you today. And as Wes mentioned, we worked yesterday on really looking at the portfolio structure and the analysis. So I wanted to introduce to you, myself to you tonight. 
uh, and then also talk a little bit about the direction that we're looking at for the portfolio and address any questions that you may have. I know there's a lot of interesting things happening in the markets between yields and changes in yields, and so I put together a couple of slides to review those with you this evening. So the first is just to introduce uh, GPA, Government Portfolio Advisors. It's a privilege to be serving the district. Uh, our firm was founded in 2014. Uh, I am the founder with my partner, Dave Westcott. We are out of Portland, Oregon. Our focus is very much on water districts throughout the country. We work with nine separate water districts, manage over $2 billion in assets of water district money alone, and that's in, across five states. So we have some good synergies between the, the client base. The firm itself, we're currently managing $24 billion in assets under management. We're 100% dedicated to local governments. We're 100% de dedicated to doing separately managed portfolios like yours. So it's a privilege, and I'm excited uh, for the things we have in front of you to be working on. So the um, first slide I wanted to put up was just to talk a little bit. I can't help but do education when I'm, when I'm focused on this. I have been in the market since 1984, 83 actually. Uh, and so I always like to step back and kind of share what's happening because the sector of the market that you're investing in, which is basically five-year maturities and shorter, are really, really uh, get, get a lot of price change. And in today's market, there's tremendous opportunities because we have not been at these interest rates for over 15 years. Um, so it's really important and we're really excited to be able to step back with uh, the finance team there, Wes, to be able to look at what are the needs there at the district? What are the cash flow needs? What are the long-term needs? And to be able to really create a what I call accountable and transparent portfolio for you. And I think there's a couple things that will be a little different in how we approach that than your prior uh, manager. And it's really that we look at everything that you have and make sure that everything's working for you as much as it potentially can be. So this picture just gives you a graph of where the, the target of the two-year Treasury note versus the three-month bill. And it's just to illustrate that we've been here before. We've been at 5% before. We haven't been at 5% since 2006. Um, and very often the markets become very volatile in this type of trend where we go up very, very fast in yields. And once the Federal Reserve shifts their position here, we likely will come down pretty fast. So I wanted to give you this as a backdrop to the strategy to be aware that what GPA really supports is we really aren't sure where rates are going. But what we do know is that they are going to change and how your investments are positioned in creating a discipline in those investment decisions will help you as an organization to get through these types of changes in a positive manner. So this next slide covers how the... Um, Go to that next slide. Um, how GPA will be a little bit different. And I think the key is that we'll be working with not only your investment component, but watching your pools components. So you recently moved money over to CAMP, which is an investment pool that you're allowed to do, and you're also using the LAFE, which is a state pool. So I'm really familiar with both of those organizations, and we look at those opportunities in those pools as the place to hold your liquidity and your, your short cash. Today they're yielding quite nicely. The camp's yielding about 550, and so that is enhancing the earnings in the portfolio. The other the component that we're watching really closely or will be building will be your core investment component. And that component is the sector that is money that's not needed for tomorrow, but longer term. And that graph I just show, illustrated to you is showing that the reason we want to support increasing that core account is because of where interest rates are overall. Um, so when we're looking at the portfolio, we look at it very holistically to help trigger when you're growing, which you are growing, being able to have a concise measure to when we add to the investments and when we keep the money in liquidity. So the next slide kind of illustrates that picture when I look at the portfolio structure. The key that we're trying, we try to determine is, and we do this in our own retirement accounts, we do it with, in any type of investment program, is how are my assets going to grow? How should they grow relative to the risk profile I'm taking? And so for us in the operating fund arena, we have a couple choices, and it's mainly maturity structure, and where should the right maturity structure for your portfolio be to optimize those earnings on that money that you don't need or daily cash? And so this shows you that the two options we're looking at is between the 0 and 3 and the 0 and 5, 
and those two options have significant out different outcomes of earnings over long-term interest rate cycles. So if we were investing in keeping our money short, similar to your pool accounts, over the last 20 years, <coughs> if you're invested in a one and a half year maturity, you would have earned $5 million more. If you're invested in a zero to five or a two year maturity, $10 million more. So this is how we as investors step back and look at where's the right balance for this portfolio. And we believe it's the two year maturity for you, which, and that's the focus we're looking at is to continue to build out your maturity structure in the maturities between one year and five years. So it's the growth of the dollar and the value of maintaining and holding the investments uh, invested longer. And I am open for questions if I get through these slides. The next slide illustrates how your portfolio has been and is invested right now. So we just got this onboarded this month and we, you do have an investment component and you do have a liquidity component. Right now your investment component is about 56 million and your liquidity component is 62 million. So this is really kind of um, lopsided from where we want to shift you, which is to a hold 30% in liquidity and 60% invested. This graph on the bottom shows you why. The graph on the bottom is showing the green line is the LAIF yields over the last uh, 10 years. The blue line at the top is the two-year treasury rate over the last 20, uh, 10 years. And then we're going to try to get a balance in between. I've really believed in all these years that we've been managing public fund money that having those balance those portfolios in two different buckets is diversification and a safer way to manage money versus having your money all in one basket. So this is that kind of support document over long periods of time in having a balanced fund in both buckets will achieve higher returns for the district. So Deanne, just a quick question. So historically our investments have been tracking LAIF, and that's the green line at the bottom. So they've historically been sort of tracking LAIF. So what you're suggesting is um, an increase over LAIF, but with not quite as much risk as the blue line. Correct. Thank you. Correct. And you need you do need a liquidity component in there too. So yes, it'll, it'll work on both. We're not going to put everything out, but we're going to have a balance in those two buckets. Correct. Thank you. Um, I do want to point out kind of the hard part is right now, if you look up at that top part, the yield on the, the book yield, the book yield is where your investments have been made and where they currently are accreting earnings to you. And they're almost at 3% right now. This, we've inherited this portfolio, but the reason that it's at three is because this portfolio was purchased all through this 20, 21, 22 area. So as investments got reinvested, they were at those lower yields. That's a function of the market jumping up so much. And then you see where your liquidity yields are, they're higher. And this is the challenge that we have in, in building out. And I really am excited for you because the timing of this for you is very, very good. You have much higher liquidity balances. Those are earning more. And now we're recommending to deploy because we think that those rates are gonna come down and then that portfolio will be anchored out. I wanted to illustrate that in a couple of slides for you as well. But hopefully this just the combination of keeping all your money in lay versus having it diversified in maturity uh, makes a lot of sense. Okay, the next slide. So this is that inverted curve and it's, it's I find it fun, but <laughs> I'm getting a lot of questions on this. And I wanted to try to explain it because it's it's um, where we kind of get stuck on looking at just yield, yield versus that growth of the dollar. So I've pointed out how we're at the very high level of interest rates. We haven't seen rates here for uh, 14 years across every sector of the market. But what's happening is that overnight money is yielding more because the market is anticipating that rates are actually going to come down. So if we think about this, that green line here is illustrating a five-year treasury note. Today, the five-year treasury notes, if we go out and buy it, is yielding a 4%. Um, and it's basically, if we keep our money in cash and ride that yield coming down, we're going to have the same effect over the next five years. We're going to earn 4%. Um, so this is a trend line of what the Federal Reserve is expected to do, and that's bringing rates down close to the 3% mark. So we want to lock in some of this portfolio at the 4 to 4.5 level, because as those rates come down, that'll create a better balance for, for the portfolio. I know that that was some of the discussions uh, prior on, on why are we investing out longer when we have that short-term rate. So I'm open for any questions to kind of drill into this any further if anybody has questions on that. 
No questions? Okay. You made it so clear. So this is where the portfolio, the blue line is representing how over the last four years that your portfolio core has been invested in, and then you look at the green line and that's your liquidity component. So you can see that this portfolio has not been rebalanced or adjusted for investments over the last four years. And that's where we're gonna come in and help oversee the whole portfolio. As your portfolio grows, we should see your investment component grow. As your portfolio comes down, we should see that shrink. So it's getting these parts to work together instead of being in isolation. And that just creates a very healthy program where if a security matures and you need that for your liquidity purposes, we move it over there. If you have excess liquidity, we bring it back to the core. And it's really uh, just makes it more confident and more healthy. So we're gonna flip this and eventually get to where we have 70% um, of the portfolio invested and 30% of the portfolio in liquidity. As interest rates uh, come down in that front end, we sure should see this play out really nicely for you. Next slide. And so our recommendation going forward, and this is what we covered in our meeting, is to move your portfolio from that 56 million up to 80 million. We're gonna do this in a couple steps as Wes is prepared to put 20 million right now and then we're gonna pause, uh, wait a little bit, watch your liquidity and then we'll make another move. But we'll time that into the market, be adding it at the four to four and a half percent rate um, in that core portfolio. So you'll see that benefit that will hit the earnings rate on that portfolio component. And these disciplines that we put are what have really helped us to manage through volatile interest rates and through time with cash flow portfolios. So by putting in limits, we're going to establish that the liquidity will never drop below 30 million. If you get close to that, that means your spend down of your cash flows, I know you guys have a lot of projects going on, are, are getting faster, and we'll be able to adjust and reduce the investment portfolio down in doing that. So that's that healthy part of getting those two components to work together. The next slide. And then this covers, I just wanted to review this just because I, I wanted to get that information out there, but we will be looking to deploy 20 million and we're gonna be buying maturities between two years and five years. And that yield that I showed you at the very beginning on the, on the portfolio investments is currently at 290. This is gonna move that yield up to 340. And my goal is to have the portfolio yielding about 4% over the, in the next six to nine months. That will be a good anchor for this to hold as interest rates come down. So that's going to be our focus is to get the, the book yield up, the earnings yield up. You can see over here too how much annual income that increases. Just in this move, that's going to increase your annual income by about 700000 So that's what we're trying to anchor down to, to solidify the income stream for the district over the next couple of years. Deanne. Yes. I have a question here. Um, mm -hmm. So part of the reason why we're kind of in this bit of a mess is because we locked into five-year bonds, five, seven, nine, right? And uh, you're going to be cashing those in early. Is that why I saw the loss is going to be? It's like 800 or something like that? If you sold those securities, there would be a realized loss. So you're going to um, hang on to those and not sell Yeah, them. we're going to we're going to hold on to all those securities. We're going to buy these in and add into the portfolio so to layer on top. Yep. And most of those securities that you own that have those low yields are 18 months and shorter. So we're going to let those mature off and that's what's going to help us get the yield on the portfolio up as well. One of the tactics that we are doing is looking at certain portfolios and selling some of those low yielding securities. We, I just wanna get the portfolio kind of matured out first for you. And then eventually we'll have gains on these securities. We'll have some losses still on that. And we'll look at rebalancing that because we likely won't see that 0.5 rate again for a very long time. So um, we will measure that, but we're not selling anything. We're not incurring losses. We're just adding to the portfolio at this time. Yep, got it. And just, um, I guess where I was going with that point is part of the reason why we were in the position that we were in is because we got locked into these a little bit, um, um, you know, at the time it seemed like a good deal, just like this seems like a good deal right now. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's not as good as a deal as overnight, as, as you said, right? So like we could be getting 5.5% or something along that is if you keep the, the camp lay route. Um, 
My concern is that, uh, you know, in the n near future, nobody knows what's going to happen, but, you know, the U.S. itself is restructuring a lot of its debt this year. Um, there's talk of the inflation rate in general being retargeted to something like 3 percent. And, uh, you know, there could be a, another coming wave of inflation and, and, and uh, you know, some other sort of factors that may end up even increasing this more. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about um, locking us into long term, even more so than we're already locked right now, <coughs> especially when overnight, like you said, is, is, is advantageous. Now, I agree with you that um, interest rates are coming down, right? Like even today, we heard that th there should be three rate decreases this year. Um, but I'm, I'm just worried about us hedging uh, for the future and, and making sure it's done safely. So I think maybe it's a, a little bit aggressive from what I've heard so far, um, but I'm curious your thoughts on kind of the macro and zooming out and, you know, preparing for what happens if uh, the dollar keeps spiraling. You know, those are really good points. Uh, the Fed did come out today and said they're holding their cores to get uh, the inflation target to 2%. So they will continue to be aggressive on that march. Um, so they are not going to be able to drop rates until we start to see that come down. Uh, it is, of course, a challenge. And that's what, the, that's what I was trying to express. I've been in here for 40 years. I'm not sure where they are going. I can't tell you they're not going to go up before they go down further. I can tell you that having a diversified portfolio in these maturities makes sense for the long run. I can say that we haven't seen the four and a half kind of level for 15 years. When that front end, when those rates do come down, they normally, if we go back to that graph, come down very rapidly, but also this sector. So instead, we'll be buying this paper at 3% instead of 4%. So uh, I'm just saying the discipline of being able to hold the course and build it, you haven't really added money to this core fund for a very long time, even though your balances have increased. And I think that's great. <laughs> I think moving to the camp was great. It's worked out really, really well. But I'm just proposing that we rebalance that to a now take that opportunity of that spike that we're seeing there in D's 23 um, and, and add that 20 million out there. Um, but it certainly could move up before it comes down. Uh, but it definitely, when I look at this graph and I'm going up and down, up and down, and uh, I, it's very difficult to time it. It's very difficult to hit those peaks and troughs. And just being able to hold a course and create that discipline, I think, will really shore up nicely for you. Thank you for the explanation. Um, yeah, I, I'm still concerned about the move to locking up even more money than, than there is right now. So I don't necessarily agree with the split there, but um, I still would like to hear the full pitch here before making some su suggestions to move forward. Okay. Okay. And that was really it. I just wanted to present and talk about the race because I know there's been some, some uh, discussion on that. And again, um, I just feel from the work and looking at the balances, you have strong historical balances. Um, they haven't, uh, we could wait um, and try to time it and I, it could work and it could, could not work. Uh, but just from what I see, there's definitely the opportunity to lose some back over to that core fund and lock down those longer rates. And Deanne, if I could ask, well, we talked about this yesterday, but we do have approximately $16 million maturing in the next year or so, 18 Correct. months, is that what it was? So yeah. if for some reason we were able, we gave her, gave GPA $20 million to put into the market and locked it up, 16 will be coming back. So if it looks like rates are still going up, we could make the decision to keep that liquid and say, you know what, it looks like they're not going to be dropping like we thought. So there are still options because it's, it is short term as far as the, the bad yields we have locked in and are maturing. Yep. Next calendar year. I think it's next. Is it next calendar year, Dan? The next calendar year, and that's a really important part and a differentiating, differentiating factor that we're doing is they were managing it to a one to five. We're managing it to a zero to five because I don't ever want to be forced to sell securities to get cash or to bring that liquidity. And also just naturally as you're buying these portfolios, the maturities roll down. So that's a really good point, Wes, is that you do have $16 million in additional money coming off that if we want to not deploy more or adjust that back down, we can. You're still going to be locking in these yields at four. You can put that back to the pool if a big decision comes out. But that forward curve that I showed in here is what the market is anticipating rates coming down. And we all know the market could be right or the market could be wrong as well. 
I, I feel very comfortable in adding uh, these securities in here at this time. Questions do my colleagues have? I guess I'll continue on that thought. I mean, you know, today as well, we saw gold and silver hitting new highs, cryptos going through the roof. People are certainly very concerned about the dollar's future, um, our government not being one of the people concerned about it, but I'm concerned about it for our citizens uh, and the people that, you know, deposited this $110 million into this reserve. So I'm trying to carefully and, and thoughtfully guide its future here. Um, and so you say, all right, so right now we're making 2.9% if you want to go back to that side. Wait, there he is, 2.9. Right um, mm -hmm. And then with the changes you're suggesting, 3.3 uh, yield. Um, so that gets you to like what, 4 million in annual revenue or something something along those lines from the 110? Uh, on the total there, your annual income would be at 2.2. Uh, 2.2, okay. Yeah. I see. But that's only on the portfolio balance, so we still it's have only the, on the, portfolio. the 30 yeah. percent that would be right. in camp that would still be earning the 5.5. I see. So that's that's the difference there. And um, so, if you took that same, you're suggesting 80, right? We're adding 20. We're suggesting to add 20 million from the camp portfolio over to here, or from LAFE over to here. Which, if you just turn that all into short. Right now, you'd have to eat the 900 grand or 800 or whatever it was. Well, it, make... it's, it's just that we might, we might lose the opportunity to lock in 4% for three to five years. That's what we're trying to hedge against, and that we haven't seen these rates for a long time, and you haven't really added anything to the portfolio, even though your portfolio is growing. So that's what I'm seeing is just putting, diversifying those two maturity structures makes sense because the indications are that rates are going to come down on the front end. Right. And by, hold, by holding that maturity discipline, that's where the growth in your assets will come. That's where the higher earnings will come from. Yep. And that's assuming there's nothing else competitive that comes out and bonds don't resurge and uh, other opportunities above 4% don't come out, right? Right. And, and what's important to this, this showing here is all treasuries. I didn't even put any agencies in here yet. But... In the, the types of securities is important, too, and what we're buying. So we're buying treasuries, we're buying agencies, we're buying corporates. I just ran this on an all-treasury uh, portfolio to illustrate this, so we will get a little bit more yield in, in adding into the agency sector. Um, I did look at the camp portfolio structure to see what their portfolio was comprised of, and they do have about 65% of the portfolio is in A1 paper, so there's a little kicker you're getting because it is a lower quality. This is going to be a really high-quality portfolio as well, so it will be mainly treasuries and agencies. Yeah. Um, I appreciate everything that you've said, and, and uh, I certainly, you know, with $26 billion, assets under management. I think it's uh, certainly wise to uh, hear you out. In my opinion, I think we should uh, actually keep it at the same ratio it's at right now in order to uh, preserve options. Is this something that we can discuss in the finance committee? Unless there's a direction needed today. Um, there's, this is no, just this for is information? Just informational item only, but we can bring this back in the finance committee if that's the pleasure of the board. Meets tomorrow, so it would be timely. Uh, well, it's not agendized for tomorrow, oh, okay. unfortunately. So next month. I go ahead. Uh, these uh, dollar amounts that are in our portfolio, is that in addition to our reserves, our sewer and water reserve, or are those reserves in that amount? It, those are our reserves. Those are yeah. our reserves. Yeah. So we have approximately 116 million in reserves right now, and that's what we're discussing. So we're we're losing money every year. Based on inflation, based on the return, uh, you know. If you compare those two, we're losing money, but. <laughs> yeah, well, what else are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, our dollar doesn't buy as much this year as it did last year, well, and apparently by these numbers, it's not going to buy as much next year. So, um, I mean, I'm going to leave it up to the financial folks, but uh, as uh, Eric said, you know, gold, silver, crypto, they're all going through the market, and we're here at three and two percent. So it's like pitching pennies against a wall, in my opinion. 
Yeah, and I'm not suggesting we invest in any of those risky assets such as crypto. I don't think they'll let us. Well, yeah, we're not allowed to. I'm absolutely not, but I, I'm just saying. Because I would. It, it's disappointing <laughs> to not be making 5.5% right now, let alone in the private sector somewhere much greater than that. But, yeah. I, I have a question. Um, in, I, as I was scrolling through the, the portfolio, uh, the holdings by security type, I, I wanted to raise a couple of points. Um, number one, we have a lot invested in federal home loan mortgage corporations. So I'm wondering if you can please discuss what your plan might be if we start to see um, sort of a dip or a crash in, um, in, in homes and home loans and things like that. So that's my first question. Um, so you have Federal Home Loan Bank and Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corp banks. All of those are the government agencies that support our housing markets and support the lending in the housing markets. Back in 08, uh, those, those lenders got um, their wings clipped pretty hard, mm -hmm. uh, which was good. Um, and there's been a lot of, I'm just, the government, U.S. government has taken conservatorship of both of those organizations. So from a credit exposure, you're protected. Um, what happens in our markets is you get a spread shift, you get a spread change. So when there starts to become risk in certain uh, issues, they, the spreads will widen out. So we will be weighting the portfolio more towards treasuries because we aren't getting paid for those securities and we will continue to diversify those as required by your policy, which is 30%. So it has happened, and we've seen that's a very good question. And as the housing market gets more pressure, we'll be watching that closely. As of right now, when we go into buy a treasury in the three-year area versus a home loan, we're only picking up about two to three basis points, so we're going to treasuries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. reassuring. My second question is, I also did not notice any fossil fuel companies per se in this portfolio. Can you discuss whether or not we have invested in fossil fuel companies? This portfolio does not today. Um, it, I love that question. Um, GPA has just really started um, to take on the next step. In, in 2017, there was a lot of questions for local governments, particularly in California, on owning sustainable um, securities. So we are not buying Exxon and Chevron in our portfolios because of that um, perspective from our public fund clients. Uh, there's a lot more that can go into that. We do have a filter that we have on our corporate list that is an ESG filter that I'm more than happy to talk to you all about um, once we, um, on our kind of our next phase, because I think it's really important. And there's basically metrics out there that measure for companies. All companies now, I'm really happy to say, are actually having sustainable uh, reports that are published. So our credit list has the links to all those and what's going on. And there are certain companies that are not doing anything. So those companies that are allowable we are taking off our list. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'll also add the comment that I love it that on the slide it says that you're a woman-owned business. That's something that I have asked of our vendors lately to discuss their DEI initiatives, and I appreciate that that was on the slide. So thank you. I'm thank sure you. Wes passed that on. And thank you for um, for your time today and your, uh, your expertise. Do I have any other questions? Just one last one, um, and this is public knowledge, so anyone can look it up anyway, so just putting it out there. And how much are the fees paid to your organization presently? Uh, we are at three and a half or four basis points. I'm sorry, I don't have that right in front of me. Fees or uh, uh, additional money made through? Uh, we, we charge assets. a basis point fee on the portfolio itself, on, and not on the LGIP part, but on the portfolio itself. Okay, I thought you were under a flat fee. No, got it. And then do you make any additional money on uh, the sale of, uh, uh, purchase or sale of any of the preferred assets no. or securities? Ab no, absolutely not. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And additionally, are there any public speakers for this agenda item? Uh, no, there's not. Okay, thank you. Okay, this item was for discussion only, so I believe we are ready to move on to action item 2.2, the water supply update. Okay, Thank nice you. to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'll kind of start this off while Chris gets set up. So uh, as the uh, board's aware that we do co provide a water supply update from time to time, and we've experienced tremendous rains last year, historic, 
uh, in the uh, mainly in the uh, California mountains and the uh, Sacramento basin, basically for the delta, and decent rains in the Colorado basins in both the upper and lower basins. But this year, I think we're seeing uh, maybe not quite as much, but still fairly historic snowfall packs both in the Sierras and I think much more significant packs in the Colorado Basin. With that, Chris, if you're ready, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, General Manager. Um, is my presentation up on the, uh, on the screen? What's that now? Share screen. Oh. Where's, uh, where's an engineer when you need him? <laughs> yes? No, there it goes, right? Jason. Okay, so uh, President Boyd Hodge and, and board members, um, fun to bring some good news. Um, we are currently in a level one drought condition. Um, back in June of uh, 2023, we were in a level two drought and the board rescinded level two and moved us down to a level one drought condition at that point. Um, we, are, we are still in the level, level one drought condition. Um, the current situation in the Pacific is that we're in an El Nino condition and this leads to warmer uh, sea surface temperatures, increased pr probability of, of rain and precipitation in the jet stream. And the uh, situation is certainly improving. This is an image from the U.S. Drought Monitor and the portion of the west that is in drought has, has decreased drastically from last year where it was about 50%. It's much less. And I'll call your attention to California and look how uh, California's looking. It's, it's, it's looking really good. The precipitation map by DWR showing those, uh, those good colorations with uh, lots of precipitation through March 10th of 2024. So that's also good news. Um, Northern Sierra Eight Station Index, where you know we really want to see a lot of this snowpack and precipitation. It's just kind of right in the pipe. I, I think you can see it on your screen. You know, currently we're we're kind of right trending where the historical averages, which is obviously uh, good news after the the good uh, session we had last uh, winter. So the Department of Water Resources gets to go out and do a snow survey at Phillips Snow Station. I'm very envious of these individuals. This is something that uh, Chris and his team would like to do. But what I want to call your attention to on this specific slide is they went out and did that third s snow survey on February 29th. So there's some good figures, 77% of average. But the really interesting thing was there was a uh, some real specific... Um, snowstorms right after they did the snow survey. Mm. So here's the snow water content. Uh, we like to see the good numbers up in the, the, the north section, which is the top uh, graph there, 111, 95 in central, and 90% in southern. And hoping this will, seeing if I can get this to actually play. So this is, a, this is a, a firm that will actually go out and drive into storms, which I think is rather interesting. Uh, I don't think I would want to do that. But uh, this is the Donner Pass blizzard I was talking about, um, where there's areas that got 100 inches of snow over uh, March 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. So this occurred right after the snow survey. So a lot of, a lot of snow dropping. Um, right after they did the snow survey. So there'll be some additional data coming in, but you know, that looks like dangerous conditions to be in. It's Donner Pass. Uh, we're all familiar with what happened uh, with the snowstorms back in the 1800s. And uh, 
You know, that's probably what it was like. Um, California Reservoir Storage, so this is, this is a nice story. I think at this point last year, we knew that the, the snow was coming in and we were going to get some, some filled reservoirs, but you know, the, these are filled reservoirs now, and then we're getting the snowpack on top of it. The uh, Lake Oroville is at 84%, uh, San Luis at 73%, and then, and then the mighty Shasta at 85%, you know, in the middle of uh, the the winter season, so that's that's some good information for us as well. This shows me we could use a couple more reservoirs. Right, a little well, bit. I was going to ask that. What happens when the reservoir becomes full? Uh, so they'll release. And is there a problem with having too much water and not and conserving too much? It, the, you, there can be a real big problem with too much water, where it overflows the dam, and yeah. you know sometimes the dams can can have Do you some. You see that happening? Yeah, not not at this particular point, and I'm not. I'm not a good enough dam guy. I'm not a good enough dam guy to uh, <laughs> know all the dams in California. But you know, there, there's been some problems with some of them. And you know, the dams get built and they get old. And even I think uh, is it is it Hodges over here? They have to release water because it mm -hmm. it it really structurally can't hold back. You know, more than a certain amount. Mm -hmm. um, Colorado River uh, as of March 11th. Precipitation looking good, 101% to date, but you know Lake Mead is still 37 and Lake Powell 34%. So that's that's the other side of the story is the things looking really good in California, maybe not as wonderful in the Colorado uh, uh, river status. But I, I do have some friends that live up in those regions and they got hit by their own blizzard. So so maybe those numbers will improve over the next month or so. Uh, seasonal temperature outlook for our regions, equal chances. Um, precipitation outlook, equal chances, although it seems we've had, you know, quite a lot of rain for our general area here. And uh, um, I know Mike's behind me there, and, and, and the revenues have taken the hit from everybody getting so much rain. So, it, it, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, and, you know, one of the, one of the cons to uh, a lot of good rain is... Uh, you know, less water sales. Finally, um, I, I, I would recommend that we continue to stay in the drought level one, drought watch status, mostly because of the concerns on the Colorado River that it's a voluntary status. And with the Colorado River still being in the status that it's at, I think it, it behooves us to stay in a level one status. So that concludes my presentation and I'm open to any questions. Okay, do we have any public speakers for this agenda item? No, we do not. Okay. Is the are, are we are we voting on this tonight, or is this for information? No, it's mainly for information. Unless the board uh, wanted to take some type of action, a majority of our water does come from the Colorado Basin. So. Okay. What questions do my colleagues have? Yeah. Okay. I I do have a a a, a question. This um, when you do this presentation, it's I always find it so informative, and then I can never find it afterwards. Do, are these put on the website? Because I don't think they go in our board packets. I, I don't think the presentation goes in the board packet, but I could certainly do that. Can we put it somewhere that's accessible? Because I, I think that this is really beneficial for, for my own education, but also for members of the public. Is it possible to, I mean, are there any legal implications for possibly putting this no, on we, the website? We definitely put it in the, the minutes as an attachment with the okay. presentation. Okay, I would really appreciate that. Okay. Um, as a final note, I would probably come back to the board in June of 2024 to provide a further update. I, I think three months at this point is kind of working out well, and, and I would appreciate board's direction if, if we want to do this more often. But at this point, the, with the status, I think every three months is working just fine. One question here. Yeah. What's uh, the drought level zero, or is it just complete? So um, they're, they're, we don't specifically have a drought level zero. It's just that they're, 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 there's, yeah. there's no drought condition that we would have. Is there any problem with letting people live three months without a DL1? Without saying the D word? Um, drought level one's a voluntary condition. I know so. it's voluntary, but I just don't want to say the D word. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm not really promulgating it at this particular time. It's, it's been rainy enough that... For, for us to be 
Maybe doing I'll... drought announcements uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's just it's it's just kind of in the background at this point. When was the last time we were, we were not in a drought room? Um, well, I came here in 2015, and we were in drought, and, and we were in drought for a couple of years, and then we dropped out of drought, and then we went back into drought. So we did drop out. Of we've been drought. in, and we've been out. Yeah, a few times. Since, since 15. In general, we follow the lead of the Water Authority, and since the majority of the water comes uh, from the Colorado River Basin, and there's still the, the uh, you know, reduction in the amount of millions of acre feet that California's taken. So if, even if there isn't a localized drought from a water supply, there technically still is a uh, voluntary need for conservation. Uh, however, you know, agency to agency may differ, but from a regional standpoint, uh, between the lake levels at the major lakes in the Colorado Basin and the fact that there's, I forgot how many million acre feet that California is going to take uh, reduction of through the new settlement with the, uh, with the federal government. And it's, there's going to be a need for something. Uh, California, though, is looking great, so hopefully we get more state water that makes up for that. We have to be nice neighbors here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with it, but regionally, I'm just saying we could set ourselves apart and put the D word in, the, you know, squash it for three months, let people live. Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> I'll make a motion. Let's get out of drought for three months and revisit the situation. Okay, do I have a second for that motion? I'll second it. Okay, do I have any discussion? Yeah, I think this is for information only. <laughs> okay, are we out of order? But, okay. There's a, there's a recommendation. Recommendation. So on, on the agenda oh, item okay. that you remain at drought level okay. one. Yeah. So you, the board can move forward with the uh, with limits action. Okay. Do I have any discussion about the motion to move to a drought level one? Are you raising your hand? Do you have? No. No. Okay. It's, it's okay. Drought, so no drought level. No to, drought level. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Drought level zero. That's what I meant to say. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to be cons stay consistent with the Water Authority. They're they're still still talking about drought level one, but not really um, advertising it. So their their public relations campaign has been pulled way back. Uh, you know, with, with uh, looking at the current conditions, so I, I'd like to stay consistent. I wouldn't support changing the draw level, particularly with the conditions on the Colorado River Basin and the, uh, the idea that, you know, that's in a 20-year drought and, and continues to, to be so. I have a question. If we move from a drought level one to a drought level zero, what action must we take in order, if we achieve drought level one again, would that require a motion and discussion from the board? Actually, general manager has the authority to put us into a drought level one uh, based on our specific ordinance. So drought level one is a voluntary condition, and, and uh, that, that purview is at the general manager level. When we go to drought level two and above, that, that requires is board the, action? The, on the purview of the board of directors. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other comments or discussion about this I mean, item? What does that mean to the local Population. Is there an announcement that goes out? I mean, what, what happens? Right? Well, I don't know what we're talking about. Be honest. Besides those in the truly room. Truly, we have um, in place permanent uh, water use restrictions. So you're not supposed to irrigate when it's raining. You are not supposed to wash your car if you don't have a shutoff nozzle on your hose. There's a whole litany of items. You're not supposed to irrigate uh, in the middle of the day. So those, all those, those are from things. Or those in, from that's Valacitos. Yes. Okay. And all those are in effect at all times. So level drought level zero or drought level one, those are in effect at all times. There isn't specifically a, a change because we're just asking for voluntary conservation with level one. So um, we just want to make history. I, I loved Chris's presentation. I think that <laughs> it was amazing. And I really trust his recommendation. I'm just trying to recognize this historic period that we're living through and uh, the savings that's being brought to our customers from it, so. Okay, any other comments or questions for discussion? And it's good to know that I don't have to take down my TikTok video of me turning my water meter off when it's raining, because I'm getting some, some likes on that. 
But importantly, we have a vote to make. So any discussion? Any further discussion? Okay. Then let's vote. I did not mean to abstain. I apologize. I meant to vote no. It's confusing. <laughs> I meant to vote no. <laughs> do we have to do redo we need it? To do it again. Thank you. Let's redo it. I'm hitting. I'm not hitting. Am I hitting the X or the minus? minus. The minus. Okay. Well, the X seems like a no. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. The motion fails. Thank you. Thank you for putting forward the motion. And thank you for your presentation, Chris. Okay, we are moving to action item 2.3, project, project acceptance for Palos Vista pump station motor starters upgrade. And I believe we are turning this over to General Manager Gumpel first. Yes, uh, thank you, President Boyd Hodgen. Uh, Palos Vista pump station is a single pump station that's located basically in our 920 zone. It feeds primarily one community, uh, which is Emerald Heights. Uh, and you can see kind of on the map, Emerald Heights is uh, basically a large HOA that's uh, adjacent to the eastern part, uh, kind of next to Escondido, but still in San Marcos. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our engineering team to present. I believe Ryan Morgan will be presenting. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, General Manager Gumpel. Uh, good evening, directors. I'm very excited to bring the project acceptance for the Palos Vista pump station motor starters project before the board tonight, largely because it is overdue. Uh, in December 2021, the board authorized a construction contract with Berg Electric uh, for the upgrade of reduced voltage soft starters for the existing four pumps at the Palos Vista pump station, which is considered an essential, an essential asset. The pump station conveys water from the Richland tanks in the 920 pressure zone to the Palos Vista tank in the 1500 pressure zone. Uh, this project secures water distribution and reliability for the Emerald Heights community, as pre previously mentioned. Uh, the original motor starters have been in service for 35 years and have exceeded their design life. Originally installed in 1989, uh, the existing Palos Vista pumps are controlled by auto transformer motor starters, which are widely used at the time to start large industrial motors. Uh, which provides really the lowest across the line starting current. Um, the new reduced voltage soft, soft starters limit the influx of electrical current and they create a gradual ramp up effect, extending the life of the motors by eliminating occurrences of across the line starts. The new motors starters will also provide hydraulic benefits to the system, uh, including reduce, reduced occurrences of water hammer or hydraulic surge. The project experienced schedule delays due to shortages in the electrical materials and manufacturing market and delays in procurement. Uh, Berg Electric achieved substantial completion of the project in February <clears throat> with an approved fiscal year 23-24 project budget of $275,000. The project is funded entirely from water replacement funds. And before and after construction photos of the motor starters inside the pump station are shown on page 55 and 56 of your board packet. Fiscal impact is shown on page 54 of your board packet. Staff prepared the contract documents and self-performed construction management and inspection services. Uh, District as needed consultant Jerry Green prepared uh, design plans and specifications and provided construction phase electrical inspections. Although the project encountered delays, the project finished with zero change orders, inclusive of staff labor and overhead professional services and construction agreement totaling $148,800, the total project cost uh, resulted in uh, $259,000, which results in a budget of uh, roughly $16,000. It's with this, the staff recommends project acceptance and authorizing the general manager uh, to file notice of completion and release retention funds to Berg Electric following the 60-day notice period, providing no claims are filed in conformance with the contract documents. And if there's any questions, I can take those now. Do I have any public speakers on this item? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. What questions do my colleagues have? Uh, you said 60 days. I thought it was 35 uh, after the notice of completion. 60. It's always been 60 for us. And mm -hmm. yes. Private work is 35. Yeah, it's always been 60 um, days. Yeah, 60 days is, is standard for um, public works. Pu public works. I'm not sure the difference there. 
Okay, well. Uh, and then the other question I have is, what's the, uh, uh, it's electric, and so what's the cost of our electric expenditure for the pump station? Do we know? On a, on a yearly? Yeah. Um, well, that's more of a question for Ed. Do you have that on the Well, I'm asking if, it, you know, if it's tens of thousands of dollars. It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, have we ever considered putting solar up there to... Uh, you got it. So we do set them up. So uh, the site won't won't really be advantageous, but this this site is one of the ones that we use to offset electricity from our uh, Twin Oaks. It so is. Twin Oaks, we could put up to fifty meters on the district. Half of it, roughly half of it, goes to Metalark because Metalark is our single largest power consumption yeah. site. But the other ones are spread between other pump stations. This is one of them. So, okay. so power is being offset through our uh, solar electric array. All right. One more question. So warranties on, on, on product, is there warranties on those? Just there is a warranty. Um, we have a standard one year parts and labor uh, warranty and we'll do an 11 month inspection at the proper time uh, to make sure everything is still in tip top shape. And uh, if there's any deficiencies, we'll have it corrected. Cool. And how long do those usually last? I mean, there's Install. Oh, the motor starters? Yeah, 20, 20 25 years is typical, okay. you know, design life for those electrical components. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, who does the green tag inspection in order for sdg &E to energize the site? Um, we, we're self-inspected as, our, as a okay. public agency, so oh. we do a certification letter when it's a new facility. But something like this that's an upgrade, there's usually none required. Well, did the site need to be de-energized? Yes. Uh, oh, yes, it sorry. did. Every time we performed work, uh, the site would be de-energized. But luckily, the pumps run at night. So shutdowns of the facility were not a, a big issue in construction as it was during the day. We did have our electrical engineer uh, consultant who provided the design. He also performed the special inspections during construction of all the electrical installations. So we did have inspections out there. Um, and that was with Jerry Green. But it's our, it's our own staff that provides the green tag inspection for SD. Yeah, for the lockout tag out for, uh, to make sure nobody gets electrocuted. Well, that, well for sdg need to energize yeah. the site once oh. the work is complete. So uh, I, don't, I actually don't know. So I, I thought you meant put it with a new facility for self-permitting. So I don't know um, when we do the uh, actual shutdown, electric shutdowns, we just do that ourselves. And coordinate with SGG &E is what I believe. That's what, it, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you for uh, coming in under budget, $16,200 under budget, and for no change orders. Congratulations on that project management. Thank you. Go motion ahead. to proceed. Great, thank you. I have a motion from Director Grossett. May I have a second? Second. Second by Vice President Pinnock. If there's no further discussion, let's vote to approve action item 2.3. And the motion carries. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we are moving on to action item 2.5, Association of California Water Agencies urges letters to be sent to the U.S. Senate on uh, PFOS and PFOA substances, comprehensive environmental response, Compre compensation and liability act uh, liability protections. Do we have any public speakers for this item? No, ma'am. Okay. So I, I guess I'm speaking to this. Yep. Right. Yeah, I could introduce a little bit because sure. uh, Thank uh, you. President Boyd Hodgins brought this forward to be to brought, bring forward to the board for discussion, but at the same time, uh, the district received the same request from Aqua uh, for a call to action for this letter. The letter that you see in your board packet is actually uh, the draft of what the district was provided from Aqua uh, and with uh, President Boyd Hodgson's signature on it to send. Essentially, within the letter, is if this moves forward for PFOS litigation, this would be an exemption under CERCLA, which currently, if there's something that happens, it goes to us as a water agency that provided water to, P to the customers but this would go back to the source, is the way I understand it. Uh, with that, uh, President Boyd-Hodgins, if you have anything to add. Sure, just briefly. So I've spoken about this at 
prior board meetings. And when I was in Washington, D.C. At, at the CASA conference, we had the opportunity to advocate on behalf of this piece of, um, or this approach. It's not a, a piece of legislation just yet. It is an approach to ensure that we protect our customers, ratepayers, from any um, potential um, financial obligations due to um, there being PFAS or PFOA in our water because we are not the originators or the manufacturers of chemicals such as PFAS and PFOA. I will uh, read just very briefly from the CASA advocacy sheet, which was sort of our, our tip sheet when we went in and advocated in the offices of um, congressional members. And it uh, also make the point that CASA is urging us to advocate for this. Aqua is urging us to advocate for this. Um, and it makes sense that we would try to enact this to protect our, um, our customers. So briefly, the presence of PFAS in the environment is a significant concern that local agencies are working to address. So the question of whether or not agencies are trying to correct this problem, that is not the question. However, clean water agencies are neither the producer nor generator of these chemicals. These agencies and their ratepayers should not be burdened with liability for cleanup costs. Congress and EPA must develop policy and regulatory solutions that hold those responsible for the production, distribution, and subsequent contamination to account. Again, exempting our ratepayers from this, from left being left holding the bag for this. As Congress considers various approaches to address PFAS, the ask is that um, that they pass legislation to exempt clean water agencies from CERCLA, as General Manager mentions, as well as a couple of other. Uh, um, uh, sub, s sort of sub asks. So what I had done was talk with General Manager Gumpel about putting together a letter that we could lend our name to that will go to um, uh, our, our, our senators, encouraging them to adopt this approach. And again, it is being, um, we are being urged to do this by two member agencies that we, are, or two agencies to which we belong, CASA and ACWA. That's my tee up. If I, I'll entertain any questions, and if I don't know them, then perhaps we can we can find out the answer. I just commend you for doing this, and I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Okay. So then the motion would be to um, uh, to accept this letter to, as as presented. May I have a motion? Move to approve. Okay. Thank you. May I have a second? Yeah, yeah. It, the motion is to uh, approve the letter to be to be signed and sent on behalf of the district. So the position, basically. Okay. The Thank. And I need to say on behalf of the district. So may I have? So let's rewind. <laughs> may I have a motion to accept this letter as presented on behalf of the district? Move to approve. Thank you. Second. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion by Director Hernandez and a second by Director Ellatharp. Any further discussion? Okay. Let us vote. And the motion carries. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Moving on to reports. General Manager Gumpel. Just three quick items tonight uh, for the board. Uh, so f we're going through our process for the new Palomar internship, and usually we have trouble drumming up internships, maybe one or two. But so far they have seven candidates, so which is good news because okay. uh, years past we had three candidates. So. Uh, the second item is a little update on the public restroom remodel. So a little history on that. Originally, the project started as a full bathroom remodel, not an ADA uh, remodel. So that's why it was a full bathroom remodel. The ADA component got added later. That being said, uh, we're moving forward. We're looking at what it would cost just to do the ADA portion. We're going to bring this back to engineering committee for review with the pros and cons. Just doing the ADA portion will save money, but we'll also have a little bit of coloration difference when you you know, repair or try and replace the tile. It's impossible to match. Maybe a little bit on the floor also. So there'll be those pros and cons will be presented to engineering committee and then brought forward to the board for full acceptance before we move forward with that project, and including new cost estimates for just doing the ADA compliance the reason for the confusion at the last board meeting was uh, 
the staff who inher inherited that project didn't realize the origination was a bathroom remodel, not the ADA component. So I apologize for that. Um, the last item is the uh, hel helipod uh, groundbreaking. It's still on tr uh, track for April 30th. I believe it's going to be like 10 a.m. Val Cetos is going to be the agency taking the lead on it. We're still working with the uh, San Marcos on some of the details and also with the county. Uh, Ed has assured me now we're done with all the work that Val Cetos is supposed to do. We're still waiting on the other agencies to do their portion. Uh, so, uh, but currently it's on, and I know they were supposed to have a meeting today, but I believe that meeting was rescheduled. Yeah, the meeting was rescheduled. So, uh, that concludes my, uh, my report. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that item about the bathrooms back to the board, and I also want to compliment my colleague, Director Hernandez, for staying after the board uh, meeting last time to... Um, with his tape measure. Yeah, yeah, with his tape measure, so thank you. Can I get a rebate from <laughs> District Legal Counsel Gilpin. This, this isn't legal per se, I, but I did set through an interesting uh, presentation by W.R. Cog last week uh, to, to the Rancho Board on demographic and population trends and its effect on the water industry. That I, I, It struck me I may have my head in a bucket, but it was very interesting. Um, their 20-year outlook is basically that we've got uh, real substantial declining birth rates and an aging population. Uh, they, they used a total fertility rate factor to report the birth rate decline. Uh, in the 50s, that rate was 3.5, and it, it needs to be 2.1 to simply re maintain the status of the population. Um, California's current level has dropped to 1.78 which is consistent uh, you know, with China, Japan, Russia, Germany, and there are, are about 100 countries or territories in the, in the world that are now below the 2.1 rate. Um, the other interesting demographic that they were saying is the aging population and the number of single occupancy, single family residences is increasing. Um, in Riverside County, over or Western Riverside County, over 20% of the houses are occupied by a single occupant. And of those, about half of those are seniors over the age of 65. So you have a substantially aging population in units that were built for multifamily, well, not multifamily, but were built for families. And uh, how, how that may impact water use, um, Etc. in our planning, it was real interesting because uh, as you know, there's the inverse relationship between the, uh, the amount of use and the rates. Uh, as Metropolitan mm -hmm. is about to show us <laughs> when it adopts new rates. But I, I thought that was really interesting and I hadn't seen a presentation of the demographic effects relative to water planning, etc. presented in quite the same way as this fellow did, but it was interesting. Thank you. That is interesting. It sort of brings into sharp relief how we need to think creatively about trying to um, divorce water income from water, <laughs> water sales, just as, as an industry, not specifically via CEDOS necessarily, but as an industry. Thank you for that. San Diego County Water Authority. Okay. Um, the board met on February 22nd, the regular February board meeting. Just a couple board actions of note. Uh, the board awarded a professional services contract uh, with DUDEC and Associates for not to exceed amount of $5.5 million to provide as needed environmental consulting services for five years. The other item of note was the board awarded a professional services contract with Recon Environmental Incorporated for not to exceed amount of $1.75 million to, to provide as needed habitat restoration maintenance services for five years. That concludes my report. Thank you. Encinitas Wastewater Authority, please. Yes, we had our uh, capital campaign committee meeting this morning, <coughs> and uh, there were a couple of items. Uh, the uh, secondary effluent electrical building and control project, a $10.7 million budget. We awarded a construction management contract to Corolla engineers for 1.4 million. This is a 36-month uh, program completion 
and Corolla's planning to spend 6,000 hours. Uh, the project uh, was originally created in 1982, and this is the new update because the components are no longer uh, replaceable, out of date, so <coughs> we're doing a whole new thing. Uh, the outfall uh, maintenance and ex external inspection report, very interesting. We have to do that every two and six years. Um, the pipe that goes out there is a mile and a half. Uh, at the end, it's 175 feet deep, 72-inch pipe uh, at the end. And uh, they had some very interesting video of, you know, the wildlife love it. I, you know, this Hurstberg thing, it just has amazed me because the wildlife, there were uh, uh, shrimp, there was uh, lobster. lobster, crab, they had this big monster sea bass. I mean, this maybe was as, half as big as this table. <coughs> and so uh, they love it, and I, we're doing great, so we got a passing grade. And uh, so and it was a $36,000 contract. So that was the end of the report. Okay, thank you. Standing committees. Engineering Equipment Committee met on February 27th. Uh, the minutes are in tonight's board package. Uh, the items for discussion, several. Fiscal year 23-24 capital improvement program quarter two update. The Las Posas waterline Rehabil rehabilitation project update. Development services projects update. Twin Oaks Valley wastewater infrastructure capacity fees. The Helipod project update. The asset management plan project update and adoption of the 2024 committee calendar. And there was a finance committee meeting on February 29th. Minutes are also in tonight's board package. The items for discussion were fiscal year 2025 budget preparation, other post-employment benefits funding status, and consider options for reducing customer bills through A, opt-in for auto bill, and B, bringing bill printing mailing in-house concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Other standing committees? Nope. Okay, seeing none. Director's reports on meetings, conferences, seminars attended. Go ahead. I have, I have two here. Let me just pull up my notes here. Um, get out of this. So I'll tee it up. Um, I went to the water reuse um, Symposium in Denver this past week and nearly got caught up in their biggest snowstorm of the year, narrowly escaped. Um, but it, this was a, a water reuse has been a topic that comes up um, with a lot of uh, constituents and customers. Uh, they're very interested based on um, the news headlines that have come out, right? So reuse. And so I thought it would be important for me to learn uh, about where we stand in reuse uh, in comparison with the rest of uh, the industry and uh, many people from the southwest region came and uh, it was great to talk to peers and and find out what they're doing as well as listen to experts on this topic and uh, going into the symposium I was very much um, um, hesitant to uh, consider even the previously known as toilet to tap um, I've re-educated myself quite a bit on it, but I'm still thinking, uh, based on what I've learned here, that the um, best move forward is to let others lead the way in this. And specifically, I sat on panels um, about um, taking into account uh, pharmaceuticals that go into the water and filtering those out, uh, as well as uh, PFOS, filtering those out. And the technology behind all of this is still being developed, and although there are some solutions on um, the uh, discussion, uh, it did not seem that they were fully ready for my personal uh, opinion of hearing these panels and experts uh, for us to use. Uh, now that being said, I'm very proud of what we do uh, with Meadowlark and Purple Pipe, and it seems that we're doing a um, by far leading job in there, and what I shared with our, uh, my colleagues, they were very impressed, and they could only hope to be in a position that we're in with that. Um, so I commend all of the work that has been done here uh, before uh, I joined. So I, it was great to uh, kind of reaffirm that we're doing the right things and to, uh, you know, stay in tune with uh, what's going on. 
And uh, additionally, I attended the one water council meeting yesterday, uh, which had two special guests, mainly talking about uh, communications to the public and working with our creating coalitions to share a unified message uh, regarding several complicated subjects, but the primary one uh, was talking near term about uh, the public assistance programs that's available, which again, I commend the district for doing a great job, and specifically the P3 committee uh, for reasserting uh, that these programs are available and making sure that our um, ratepayers and customers know that uh, they could take advantage of them. So that's my two reports. Thank you. Other conferences? So I will speak briefly uh, about the, my attendance at the Regional Water Quality Control Board. I attended earlier in the week, and um, on the docket was the Lake San Marcos and San Marcos Creek cleanup um, uh, abatement uh, order. And several of us went down to advocate on behalf of the, uh, the lake being cleaned up quickly and without delay. The Regional Water Quality Control Board did choose to pass the, the ordinance, the cleanup and abatement ordinance. Um, there will be more discussions about that to come, but uh, I, I, I know that I speak as an individual uh, that you know, we, everybody wants the lake to be cleaned up as soon as possible. And so um, the devil will be in the details, but more discussions around that are to come, and I heard my Lake San Marcos constituents who happened to be there and were also advocating, I heard you loud and clear. So thank you for attending and for your advocacy, and I was happy and honored to be there on behalf of, um, not on behalf of the district, as an individual, thank you, as an individual uh, who also happens to be the president of the board of the Vallecitos Water District. Anything else? I'll just say I watched the meeting for last week, which, or, sorry, two weeks ago, which I was absent for, and uh, commend everyone for doing a great job on that, and especially for uh, passing the extended period of uh, email retention. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you. Thank you for making that suggestion. Okay. Directors, comments, future agenda items. I, I would like to, at some point, have a for information only item presented on water reuse, the types, where we are with that, what it would take to implement something like that as sort of a general backgrounder, just for information only. It doesn't have to be next meeting, but I would like to see something like that because not all of us went to the Denver conference. And as more districts are talking about this type of process, I think it's good for us to be educated about what, what it could look like in our district. So uh, just to be clear, so bringing back to a future board meeting, not only what the district does for water reuse, but what other options are out there, what other plans there could be, uh, you know, kind of our master plan of what could be for water reuse, or just a generality about water reuse options in the industry. I think an educational backgrounder, you know, it, it needs to be relevant to us for our public education, but I think, um, I, th I think sort of starting from a, 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 an assumption of a baseline knowledge of relatively zero, would, that's, okay. the, that's the guidance I would offer. And if I could have somebody second that, that would be uh, lovely. I'll second that. And I think it would be important to include uh, potable reuse options um, along, along with that. So if I'm hearing correctly, we'll come back uh, at a future board meeting with not only just an overview, overview of water reuse, what Valacitos does, and what options are available to Valacitos in the future, if the you know if if the board so chooses in some time in the future, so which includes water reuse and potable reuse. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So we'll look forward to seeing that at some time to be determined in the future. I think I'm looking forward to that presentation, and thank you, Director Grosset, for for spurring or inspiring that idea. Appreciate that. Any other? Comments, future agenda items. Okay, then having no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.